Game 2 of the final of the FIDE World Cup took place today. So could Sergei Karyakin bounce back after his defeat in the first game? Well, it was a tense encounter. Karyakin with the white pieces today, and it's a Spanish. And once again, Svidler has played a closed variation. Uh, if you remember against uh, Anish Giri, he played the Zaitsev variation. Uh, today he played the Brea variation, also you know, one, uh, one of the main lines, you could say. Now the point of this knight retreat is to redeploy it to d7, and that's a much more harmonious setup. Very nice piece position, and when the bishop comes to b7, it's no longer blocked by a knight on c6. Also, it means that the c pawn is free to advance. Maybe c6, maybe c5. Very sound system for black. So Karyakin plays in the normal way. And you can see that before white plays this, he has to deal with the threat to the e-pawn. So he drops the bishop back to c2. And now rook e8. This has all been seen hundreds and hundreds of times before. And here the normal, or, or the most popular continuation, is to play knight f8. And bring the knight to g3, as we've seen many times in Spanish. But... Karyakin remained true to uh, the systems that he liked, and he played a4, which, well, Karyakin has played it in the past a couple of times, and also Anand, um, so this move has its adherence as well. So a little bit of pressure on black's queen side. Bishop drops back, Okay, the standard little curl-up routine, and bishop d3. So this is one of the points that White puts a bit of pressure on b5 and prevents black advancing with c5. c6, just holding the position, uh, holding the pawn, that's fine. So as I said, this is a speciality of Karyakin's. He's played this previously against Ponomaryov. Ponomaryov played queen c7 here. He's also played it against Carlsen. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's tested this already and... Well, it's clear that if Svidler was going in for this, then he was ready with uh, some preparation, and that's exactly what happened. So b4. You can see from the pawn formation that white has a slight positional advantage, because he has more space here. And here, Carlson played queen c7. Uh, Portish once played g6 against Nigel Short. But today, Svidler came up with a new move, c5. Well, this is extremely sharp. You can see there's so much tension in the centre, and that rook stands opposite the queen. Um, it's a very bold attempt to challenge white centre. OK, let's see what happens. I mean, really, white only has one continuation that attempts to play for the advantage, and that's to take here. And I was expecting d take c5, and th this is very complicated. Maybe d5, probably best to take on e5, and, and that involves a pawn sacrifice, but black certainly has compensation. But very quickly, Svidler took on d4, and this really blows the position wide open. It's so complicated. Svidler only thought for 38 seconds before playing this move, so it's quite clear that he was in his preparation. And Karyakin thought for some time and kind of dampened things down a little bit with his next move, c6. I think that the critical move is certainly to take on d4. And then, you know, you get these, these clash of, of pawn, pawn duos here, and e5 is obviously very, very sharp, and Svidler would have had to work this out beforehand. Um, in fact, black is okay here. Obviously, if the knight moves, then bishop takes pawn check. But black is actually okay after c4. And if bishop f5, then incredibly after g6, it seems black is all right here. 
basic idea is if white takes this, well, first of all, you bring the knight back to the back rank. And in this position, although the g-pawn has gone from in front of black's king, in fact, black is absolutely fine here with the two bishops, and um, yeah, black black is fine. There are, there are no, no other pieces apart from the queen can attack the king. But fantastically complicated position, and... You know, I have a funny feeling we haven't seen the last of uh, this particular variation. Anyway, c6 from Karyakin. He played it a little bit, well, rather safe, actually. So it's possible for black to take here. Um, and then play b4. And it's roughly balanced, but it's a double-edged position. But Svidler saw the opportunity, he thought for half an hour here, he saw the opportunity to simplify the position completely and, and basically just play for a draw. Well, after this capture, there's a forced simplification. So white takes the bishop, black takes. Now, if pawn takes, then this is equal straight away. So white has to play queen takes d2 and the rook steps aside, and white takes on b5. And at first, Svidler had imagined that he could simply take here. Well, he can. I don't think this is too bad for black. But he was worried that somehow white might get some initiative after this, and a tr an awkward trade, and maybe e5 or something. So instead of taking immediately, he played queen b6. I think it's a good move. Hitting the bishop. Rook b1, then queen takes b7 with some pressure on e4. So white has the two bishops, but making anything of it in this very simplified position is hard work. And actually, over the next few moves, I mean, I, I was kind of expecting the players to, to half out very quickly, but Karyakin, I thought, found some really precise moves to, to keep something in this position. So he's got the two bishops. He has to make sure that he manages to, to keep enough tension here, keep the pawns on the board. Queen a2 still looked as though Svidler was uh, doing absolutely fine here because at the moment the bishops can't do much. Svidler was running a little bit short of time. Um, he wanted to play d5 to simplify straight straight away. But there are many variations to consider here. Maybe e5, he, he also thought maybe knight g5. Um, in fact, it should be okay for black. But he couldn't be absolutely sure. And he said, you know, if, if that goes wrong, he could just be lost. So he thought, okay, play it safe. Stop knight g5 in some variations. Give the king an escape square. h6 looks solid. But Karyakin found some nice moves. Queen c1. So, obviously there are some latent threats against black's queen, so it has to go back. And now bishop c4 brings the bishop to this very nice diagonal, looking at the sensitive f7 square. This is really white's only hope to try and break through. Svidler still thought he was okay. If queen f4, then you can hit this bishop, everything's fine. But queen d1, very good move. So, obviously knight e4 not possible. Bishop d5 will win material. So rook e8. Still seems as though black is fine, building up pressure on this pawn. But now, an interesting exchange from Karyakin. Gave up the bishop pair, but this allows him to break with e5. And suddenly... Bishop and knight bear down on the sensitive pawn f7, and there's only one decent way to defend it, and that's rook e7, which looks incredibly ugly. So Karyakin still has pressure here. It's not much, but as Svidler said, this in practical play, this is very unpleasant for black. Um, particularly, he was running short of time, and really... Well, white risks nothing here. 
Queen d8 is interesting and looks terrifying. In fact, black should be fine after, say, queen b4 or queen c7. Spindler thought queen c7 wasn't working. In fact, it is. He thought knight f7 was uh, a good move, but queen c4 is actually um, drawing straight away after here and queen c1 and queen f4. It's the kind of little tactical sequence. It's very easy to miss when you're short of time. So I think queen c7 is still fine uh, and... Well, as, as he pointed out, queen b4 is also fine. Karyakin played instead queen d4. Well, it's a strong move, um, taking away lots of squares. Um, and now, well, I think black can wait, but, it, you know, it's not so easy to do that here, actually. Svidler thought for a few minutes and decided to attempt a simplification. He played knight d7. Now, if white trades, then clearly this is just a draw. Or if white retreats, this is just a draw. Black simplifies. But it's a scary move, knight d7, because you have to analyse knight f7. This is what Karyakin played. And here, well, of course you can take... But white has nothing better than a draw in this position. Still very scary to analyse. You know, when you see variations such as this and mate in one, in fact, black is still absolutely fine here. And this is just a draw by perpetual check, actually. But Svidler had to calculate all that. But instead, Karyakin tried to keep some tension. He played rook b2, hoping to send the queen to a, to a poor square. But queen c6, correct, from Svidler. And, well, bishop takes rook is just a draw. Queen d5 is just a draw. Um, nothing nothing really going on there. Um, but Karyakin still wanted to keep some tension in the position and played rook b5. He had plenty of time. But... This was a terrible mistake, because suddenly, out of the blue, black is winning. At first, Svidler said he wanted to play knight f6 and just you know, make a draw. But suddenly he realised he could play king h8. And this is a winning move, because obviously if the rook is taken, then queen takes, and black is a piece up. Um, it's probably winning. But Karyakin made things worse by playing rook d5, and that lost instantly to a simple knight fork. White loses more material, and so Karyakin resigned. An absolute disaster for him. Um, hard to explain moves like this, except this is the end, at the end of a very long tournament, and the players are very tired. Um, that means that Svidler... Peter Svidler has won the first two games. He just needs a draw to win the title. Um, in the press conference afterwards, he said, with with very fine understatement, I should say, I should be a favourite now, but it's definitely not over. Well, let's see. <laughs>